four years ago, the three minutes. On her 10th birthday, Nessa overhears an argument in her parents' bedroom. She knows nothing about the three minutes yet. How could she? The whole of society is working to keep its children innocent. She plays with dolls. She believes the lies about her brother. And when her parents tuck her into bed at night, her grinning dad, her fussy mum, they show her only love. But now, with ten candles on a cake in the kitchen behind her, that's all supposed to change. Dad can't know his daughter is right outside the door, and yet he whispers. We don't need to tell her, he says. She, she isn't able to run anyway. She's a special case. We could give her a few more years to be our baby. Baby. Our baby. Nessa bristles at the thought. She's struggling to stand still because with her twisted legs, she makes quite a racket when she walks. However, once her mom Agnes starts sobbing, she decides she's had enough. Oh, for crumb's sake, she says. I'm in the hall. I'm coming in and you two better not be kissing. She means that last part as a joke, but it falls flat. Come in then, Dad says. He still possesses enough greying hair to cover his scalp. Almost. He's even older than Mam, and on a bad day, Nessa wonders if that's why she was born weak enough to catch polio. Her cousin told her that once, and Nessa often thinks of it. I know about Santa Claus, she says walking in, if that's what this is about. I've known for years already, but... Agnes starts heaving like she's being punched in the stomach. She shakes hard enough to rattle the bed beneath her. Dad wraps her tight with his long, skinny arms, and for a moment, it's like this hug is the only thing stopping bits of her from flying off. A chill steals up Nessa's spine. She can't know it, but this is the first hint of the fear that will never leave her again, that will ruin her life as it has ruined the life of everybody in the whole country. Now, Dad is crying too. His tears barely show. A hint of moisture about the eyes, his sobs thick, as though squeezed through a wad of cloth. Nessa takes a ragged breath. Whatever it is, and deep inside, a part of her is begging her to shut up, to stop, to turn around. Whatever it is, I want to know. So they tell her about the three minutes and what has happened to her older brother. And she laughs because that's her nature and the whole situation is absurd. It's one of her dad's stupid pranks. Of course it is. But they keep the horrible story going and the fear builds up and up inside her until she screams at them, hysterical, horrified. You're lying! You're lying! She falls, her awkward left leg giving way. For the next two days, Nessa refuses to play or to talk. But she's too intelligent not to recognise the truth. The clues have surrounded her for a lifetime already, and the, only the monstrousness of it, allied to the trusting nature of her now ended childhood, has allowed her not to see it before. She has never asked herself where all the teenagers were, or why she has almost never spoken to anybody who is 17 or 18 or 20. But if she refuses to let the doctors put her to sleep, this is the future. Sometime during her adolescence, the Shiva will come for her as they come these days for everyone. They will hunt her down and if she fails to outrun them, 
Nessa will die. On the third day, her twisted legs carry her out of her bedroom. Her eyes are dry. She says, I'm going to live and nobody's going to stop me. She believes every word of it.